So in the prevailing atmosphere that we find ourselves in today, with a climate emergency, rising food costs, spiralling energy prices, approaching peak oil, all of these factors can leave us feeling a bit hopeless and that we are powerless to do anything about it. Various worthy organisations and charities assail us with information about little things that we can do to make a difference. And whilst that is great, I for one would favour a rather more radical solution. And that's why I've set up this project to found an eco-village in South Wales. So the reason for choosing the area, apart from it's where my family came from, is that the Welsh Government, uh, being rather more far-sighted than some other UK governments and others around the world, has set up um, a fantastic planning policy called One Planet Development, and you can find more information about this. Um, there is a link below to the One Planet Council website. Now, under this scheme, it allows for developments in the open countryside which follow certain rules, such as being carbon neutral, being off-grid, so generating their own water, their electricity, dealing with their own waste, and growing a certain percentage of their own food. Now, there have already been several successful OPD sites, settlements, founded, but most of them are individual or, or loose associations of a small number of individual OPDs. The model would be a fantastic basis for creating an eco-village, but so far this hasn't really been tried. At the moment there are actually several um, groups who are independently looking at the feasibility of founding um, small-scale eco-villages across Wales. And I'm in contact with a lot of them. Um, we do have networking meetings and try to help each other. Um, what our group specifically focuses on is that we want to found um, a vegan eco-village. Um, now, the reasons for this are partly ethical, but also to do with sustainability. Obviously, the amount of agricultural land that is used to grow animal feed is absolutely absurd. In fact, a recent report by The Economist demonstrated that we would use 76% less land by following a vegan diet. Um, particularly it's cow and sheep farming are the worst offenders in this, using a disproportionate amount of land. Also in terms of creating a closed uh, cycle, in terms of waste, reuse, recycling, it's much easier to create an efficient system if everyone um, is avoiding eating animal products um, because it avoids so many unnecessary toxins getting into waste products. However, um, I should point out that we do want to take um, a flexible and pragmatic approach to veganism, which I realise um, will offend some hardcore vegans, so I apologise for that, and that's why I want to be quite clear about it. Obviously, um, we want to avoid all forms of animal exploitation. That doesn't mean that we can't keep animals, you know, pets, rescue animals, um, at the site, because I, for one, love animals, and I'm sure many other people who choose not to eat them do so because they love animals and um, so we don't want to exclude them and we think that the principles of zero waste should come first so for example if you were to take in rescue hens or ducks we don't think it's appropriate to say well you must throw their eggs away rather than eating them or selling them so that would be a possibility if somebody wanted to do that um, but obviously Keeping them as egg laying machines is not appropriate. Um, so in terms of um, what we're aiming to do with um, sustainability, we're looking at permaculture principles. Um, that's been a huge influence. Um, we aim to meet the vast majority of the village um, food needs um, by simple practices of sensible crop rotation, small scale farming. Um, one of the ways um, to make it more efficient is to share certain food growing activities, so rather than each person growing their own food and having a lot of duplication of, of crops, um, we plan to surround much of the village with an edible forest, um, which is a term you may well have come across. Um, there's a lot of videos on YouTube about edible forests. Um, it's important to note that some of the videos you see are often... Um, 
will often depict tropical locations. A lot of people, when they hear edible forest, they think it's a kind of dense, closed canopy forest. That can work in tropical locations, and here's how some of these have been done. But this is um, a temperate <laughs> edible forest, obviously, um, it is in the UK. So when we say forest, we don't actually mean a very yeah, closed canopy type woodland, which is a, a rare environment, uh, naturally, in this country anyway, um, just because whatever some rewilding people may tell you. <laughs> Sorry, not true. Um, the, we're, we're interpreting it more as the sort of medieval definition of, of a forest, which is not a closed canopy woodland. It's a very open pasture type woodland. Um, the reason being that we don't get enough sun. So otherwise, very few things actually live in a dense forest um, in this country. Sadly, this is not the Amazon rainforest. So yes, we aim to um, create an environment that is as natural as possible with the highest amount of biodiversity. Um, and happily, um, that also creates the largest amount of food because of wildlife, but also for humans, because after all, we are animals too. So yes, um, we're going to be looking you know, as much as possible to you know, self-managing systems, the nature do as much as possible for us and that is the aim. Now you may be thinking <laughs> in the UK um, can you really grow all of your own food? Well the answer is mm, yes and no. Um, technically it is perfectly possible to do since humans did survive here um, reasonably well for thousands of years before um, imports were a thing. However, um, obviously, we do want to be healthy over the winter. Um, but modern technology does mean that actually, yes, we can extend the growing season considerably. Polytunnels are not the most um, aesthetically pleasing things in some people's eyes, mine included, um, but they do serve a very useful purpose. And um, certainly if, if funds allow, um, there are various other options to look at, like cob greenhouses and so on which um, can massively extend the, the growing season of your fruits and vegetables and that um, alone can um, really be of assistance. But it's important to note that also the OPD requirements don't require you to go back to living as if it was the Middle Ages. Um, <laughs> whilst your electricity will be generated using renewable sources, you will still have electricity, Wi-Fi and so on. These things can um, obviously be accommodated. Um, you may have to use less electricity, but it doesn't mean you won't have it. And by the same token, yes, you can still pop to the supermarket. So yes, over the winter, obviously, we will have to buy in certain amounts of food, but um, bearing in mind just how much food it is possible to grow, even in a small space, um, in, um, in these types of projects during the summer, and if you don't believe me, as I say, there are a wealth of YouTube videos, I will link some below. Um, which will demonstrate just what is possible to achieve and therefore with sensible preserving um, it is amazing how close to self-sufficiency you can actually become um, in terms of food production. During the summer um, looking at all the um, you know, comparable examples of what we're trying to do um, we should have a very large surplus and this obviously will generate a certain amount of income. Now in terms of speaking of finances and so on. So how we envisage this running, um, and I realise this is quite an important topic for many people, they want to know how much it's going to cost, so apologies if some of this is a little bit vague. Um, I have run this past a number of organisations who are advising us, but um, there is still more you know, hammering out of details to be done. But the idea is that we will create a cooperative rather than any kind of com commercial company. So. Um, the members of the cooperative will um, just be the residents of the village, so so there won't be any you know outside stakeholders, shareholders, that kind of thing um, interfering. The cooperative society obviously will buy the land, and we have various um, funding options we're looking into for that. We also have a certain amount of private finance um, from members to get us going. Now, once we have the land, um, we plan to split it up into plots of approximately two acres each. Each household will then have this one plot. They can develop that as they choose, um, including building a home on it. Obviously, if you're thinking, I don't know how to build a house, don't panic. That is one of the advantages of doing this in a community, is that we can pull community resources. Hopefully some of our members will have experience of building. 
others of growing things, others in completely different areas, it doesn't matter and we can all learn together. Um, also by doing it as a cooperative we've got a wider pool of relatives, friends and so on that you can then reach out to other people and other people and bring in more and more volunteers. As I say there is a wealth of information on other people who have done this, for example if you check out the Living in the Future series, linked down below, that is a fantastic place to start. But there are a multitude of different house designs that you could choose. Now, um, one of the OPD requirements is that your um, additional income that you need to pay for things that you cannot grow, um, including supermarket trips during the winter, but also things like your um, internet connection and council tax, those kinds of things. You need to generate that income also from your land, and this is what they call a land-based business. So in some way, the produce of your land must be providing that income. Now that could be by growing vegetables directly for sale, but it could also be you could make them into jams or wines, or perhaps you could grow um, willow for coppicing and make baskets and other, um, what's it called, other, you know, weaving crafts and so on. Um, it could be all sorts of things. And as I say, we're not completely ruling animals out of the process, providing that's not the primary reason for keeping them. So for example, you could set up a, a rabbit rescue where you, you rescue angora rabbits. And um, as you have to groom them anyway, there's nothing stopping you from, from um, making crafts with that, that surplus uh, fur. So, so there are various, there are various options. Um, the only stipulation being that whatever you are doing, it must be cruelty free, not involving exploitation of sentient beings. You can also make um, a supplementary income from teaching, um, running various workshops um, and that kind of thing. In particular, um, because we're doing this as a community, we are also looking at ways to run joint businesses, obviously, so for example, if an awful lot of members, or if a certain number of members require a particular tool, a particular type of workshop, then it would make more sense to um, for the co-op to then pay for that collectively and everyone have the use of it, that kind of thing. But alternatively, you know, you can do your own thing on your own plot. This is not some kind of commune, don't worry, you know, you won't be forced into, into doing that. But it is a community, so we will have the, the help there um, available for, um, for anyone who needs it, because that is the natural way for humans to live after all. The rest of the site um, will then be owned by the co-op, so as I say, most of the village um, will be surrounded by an edible forest. Don't worry if that's going to, you're thinking that's going to shade your solar panels because as I say, it's a nice open um, kind of system and um, yes, that will be, if you don't know what an edible forest is, here's a nice graphic giving you the, uh, the basic principles and um, there is a wealth of uh, resources uh, online as well um, that you can find out more about it. I know I keep saying that but I don't want to bore you with uh, obviously <laughs> going into details about things you, you, you may know all about already. Um, we also will have um, cultivated veg beds um, throughout the village, some of which would be done as market gardens, so growing produce for sale and um, a lot more of it will feed the entire village really because um, in a lot of cases food growing is just more efficient if um, it's done collectively. Um, and the, um, the surplus income obviously will go back into the co-op and that will allow for community projects such as for example our community buildings. So obviously this will just have a, the time scale of this is, is over for a while this is obviously um, not all going to be done for in a year say. But um, we, yes, are hoping to include buildings like um, a kind of community hub where we can have um, weekly meetings and we can also run you know, events, courses, potentially, all these kinds of things. Um, also potentially a village shop so that um, everyone can sell their produce in one place. And we also look to run veg box schemes and so on, um, delivering out to local communities. Um, also, um, suggestions for community buildings include something like a well-being centre and um, potentially uh, retreats, um, focusing again on, on, on well-being, improving people's uh, general health, stress relief, all these kinds of things. And um, as I say, 
depending on the group of people that we eventually end up with living in the village, that will decide what we feel is important um, for us to create. A forest school has also been suggested. So there are various um, options that we can look at as we go along. So the way that we envisage this working once we get buildings, um, once we start to get things set up, is that every member of the co-op would contribute um, a certain amount of their time um, and that would be perhaps one day a week working for the co-op in some way. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be doing physical labour, it could be working in the gardens, planting, maintaining the forest, um, maintaining buildings, but it could also be for example when we get the village shop um, up and running we need somebody to staff it, also we'll need people to run courses, events, do general admin, all of these things. So depending on people's um, abilities and preferences we should be able to find something that everyone is happy doing. And in return obviously everyone gets a share of the produce um, and foraging rights in the edible forest. So um, we can go in and help ourselves. Um, so to um, clarify um, about finances, obviously you're probably wondering well, how much would this cost um, to buy into. Now as I say, um, once we've established the actual the co-op and all future residents will become members of that, and the co-op will then um, as a you know, separate legal entity buy the land and we are hoping to finance that as I say through we've got quite a lot of um, private finance options um, but also we may look at various grants, loans and various other options um, in order to buy that up front. Thus members of the co-op do not necessarily need their own private funding. It would be useful to have a certain number of members with that, well, we do really have some, however do not feel that if you don't have the money you can't be a part of it, that is not the case. And the reason for that is that once we have the land secured, we are then going to look to, um, to, to sell off the individual plots to members. Now the price of the land will be based on the actual price of the land, so depending on the size of site we eventually choose, which will depend on the number of members, um, that we envisage getting. Obviously um, that, that price will simply be split up by the number of acres, so um, the price per acre times two and that will be the price of the two acre plot. Um, so that would be an option to simply purchase the two acre plot at cost price. However, um, what we aim to do is to set up a system whereby for those who don't have the money, you can also use a form of um, what we call sweat equity whereby you work for extra days for the co-op um, and pay a small rent on the plot instead. So you can still um, get your house built, obviously you can live in temporary accommodation whilst that's happening um, and there are various options around that. But, um, but yes, essentially you rent the plot and then by working for the co-op you gradually build up equity within it so that if you then later choose to leave you can then sell that back to the co-op and if you have built up the entire equity obviously you own the plot. Um, so yes, the individual plots will therefore be owned either by payment up front or by working out sweat equity by each resident and that means that um, in the future if you decide to leave you can sell your plot um, in order to gain that money back. Um, and along with obviously whatever assets you have put on it, house and so on. Um, we will have a stipulation that can only be sold back to the co-op, um, so the co-op will always make sure that we keep a surplus amount of money available to, in order to buy those plots back from them, um, and that means that we can then sell it to another person um, and ensure that it does not fall into the hands of a property developer. Um, but we are exploring the various options um, for how to do that at the moment. It may work on a, on a lease base system whereby you're given a temporary lease to the land but the co-op is contractually obliged to always renew that lease so long as you fulfil the requirements which is basically giving your OPD management plan plus um, and not farming animals. <laughs> That's basically it. So. Um, Yes, I, I'm currently exploring the various, the various options of that, and once we have a, a definite answer, obviously that will be um, explained. But um, it's something that, um, as with many other things, it will be for the residents or future residents to decide. So once we have um, a group together, um, we can obviously go into more detail about that.
So to sum up the matter um, of finances, obviously if you do um, you know, have a nest egg sitting by that you don't know what to do with or you plan to sell your house or whatever then, well that's kind of got you covered. Um, the current price of land that we're looking at is about average of about £8,000 an acre but um, it does vary wildly. And the nice thing about this is we don't necessarily need nice quality agricultural land um, from, yeah, for, for various reasons. And ha in terms of house building, you know, people have paid anywhere for eco houses from, you know, 3,000 to you know, 60,000 pounds, sort of, which it's still far, generally speaking, far che cheaper than um, buying a house. Obviously there are the infrastructure um, costs, things like solar panels, wind turbines, all these kinds of things are obviously not cheap. But, as I say, we are going to do our absolute best to try and make sure that once the co-op is up and running, we can help people out. In particular, we really want more local people um, to get involved. We don't know exactly where the site is going to be now, we're looking at a number of sites across South Wales. Um, but we are planning to locate it somewhere near to urban areas, so although it will be in the open countryside, it won't be inaccessible because um, obviously we do want to try, if possible, <laughs> to be able to make use of public transport in order to get to um, available markets um, where we can sell produce and so on. And obviously we don't really want to encourage people to drive miles all the time to come visit or whatever. So if funding is likely to be an issue for you, please, please do not let that put you off um, joining. As I say, um, some of the schemes that we're looking to put in place we may not be able to do immediately. It may have to wait a little while for things to to um, to sort of come together. But that doesn't mean that you can't be a member. You certainly can, because obviously, running the eco village in itself is a process that's going to take several years. So um, there's no reason why you can't be a future resident for um, for all of that time. All we are really looking for at the moment is is a passion to see this project go ahead and, and commitment to that, um, which at the moment simply means attending um, our weekly meetings. These are being held online. We are hoping to eventually have some in-person meetups, but um, obviously at the moment we do have members from all over the country, so that's not entirely practical um, at the moment, but that's fine because uh, obviously technology um, is our friend here. Um, in particular, um, we really do welcome um, members of all ages as well. There tends to be um, a certain bias towards younger people getting involved with projects like this. This it, it may seem like an obvious consequence of a certain amount of physical labour being dictated by this, but actually it really doesn't make sense, especially when, to be brutally honest, most of the um, the sort of financial uh, capital is, is held by much older people these days. So. Um, it would be really, really great if um, we had a much wider age spectrum um, getting involved with this. Um, don't feel that a lack of physical ability is going to be any uh, handicap to get involved with this project, simply because um, that is the benefit of the community. The less physically able, for whatever reason, um, can get involved in teaching projects. As I say, we have a wealth of admin tasks. Um, there is a load of stuff that needs doing apart from you know, the planting and building that will eventually come into it. So, everyone can make a valuable contribution. At the moment, all you need to do is show up to Zoom meetings. So, if you are thinking that this all sounds rather wonderful and you would like to get involved, then please visit the website below. There is a link in the description to the video. Um, please do um, take some time to uh, read the website. There is a frequently asked questions page on there. So if there's anything I've missed um, in this video, you should find the answer there. And then if you um, if you like the look of the project, there is a contact form um, on the website, which you can use to send a message um, expressing your interest. Um, we then have a questionnaire that we send out to um, all potential members so that we can you know, learn a bit more about you. And you can then um, attend our weekly meetings. Um, these are in full sessions, they're open to everyone, even if you just want to come along and meet people and see how you get on, you're very, very welcome to do that. So please do get in touch. We also have a Facebook page, um, which is open to anyone to just 
keep an eye on what we're doing, share news, that kind of thing, various events that may interest people. And then we have a private one um, for members, which you'll be invited to um, if you become a member. As I say, I have put links in the description below to um, a variety of websites, videos, um, etc. exploring um, some of the topics I've, I've talked about. So if any of these were unfamiliar to you, please do um, visit these, uh, these sites and, and so on. And um, you can familiarise yourself. Um, with what we are trying to do. There are also a number of books um, and further resources which we've linked on our website. Uh, if you have any further questions that I haven't answered here or um, are not detailed on the website or Facebook page, then please um, do feel free to get in touch. You can um, send a message on the Facebook page or use the contact form on our website. So thank you for watching um, this video. Hopefully it answered um, any questions that you may have. As I say, if you do still have any, please get in touch. And I hope you will consider joining us in building a sustainable future together.